We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. At its best, the digital revolution will empower, empower connect, connect, inform, inform and save and lives. lives. At its worst, it will disempower, disempower disconnect, disconnect, misinform, misinform and cost and lives. Cost lives. Hi. Uh, my name is Alexandre Maral, and you're listening to Digital Rights Explored, Local Fights, Global Perspectives. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you might notice that something just different than the usual. This is a special episode that we're recording here as part of the United Nations Internet Governance Forum here in Katowice, Poland. And we're really excited because this is the first time that we have a, love, a live audience here with us. So that's going to be exciting. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, so it's going to be a very interactive discussion. We're going to have a Q&A at the end. So if you're excited to ask questions, uh, just wait a little bit. We're going to have a little bit of a narrative beforehand. Uh, but then at the end, everyone's going to have a chance to hop in, ask their questions. And because here at the podcast, we explore some of the most relevant digital rights violations of our time. Uh, and the idea is that citizens and practitioners listen to it to engage in a discussion about their digital rights. So we talk at grassroots level with people who have personally been affected by violations. And today, those people are coming from Myanmar and India. We also interview experts to draw parallels of what's happening in a broader digital context. And in doing so, we try to find possible solutions to these challenges. So in this episode, our focus is on internet for all, but privacy for me. And as people get online and use digital technology to communicate with each other, they're encouraged or even forced to share significant amounts of personal information. But what happens when this data is collected? And what happens when this data gets into the wrong hands? Um, we're seeing that government bodies, while digitizing their services, are also violating citizens' digital rights by surveilling them, criminalizing people on their data, and violating their right to privacy. So today we'll begin by checking the situation in Myanmar, where citizens face three checkpoints where the digital devices are being checked by the military. And I'm going to invite our first guest of the day, Eni Zaman, uh, to join me. Uh, Eni has first-hand experience on how uh, in closed societies and dictatorships, digital security can be closely related to one's physical security. She's been working on the ground in Myanmar and uh, throughout the crew, the coup, and now is helping journalists and citizens there since the situation is too dangerous uh, to keep themselves safe. So Annie, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, so uh, here we are um, talking about Myanmar and what we have seen since the coup uh, on February 1st, uh, 2021 that so many um, rights of the citizens in Myanmar have been curved when the coup came and the martial law was later declared. Initially, what we saw was that uh, the first day of the coup, all the um, jammers were like suddenly like uh, became active. And initially, like all the um, phone services were blocked, internet was blocked, that later came uh, the nightly uh, nine hours internet uh, uh, shut down, then came like some days where there was no internet. And suddenly like uh, Myanmar that uh, saw that became such a big uh, industry for like, you know, growing industry for telcos in 2013, it suddenly shrank like, you know, no one was able to uh, communicate with one another. And main uh, reason uh, was that, that the uh, military, uh, took over and wanted to surveil everyone. And the surveillance system, uh, it, the whole coup actually gave them a, a free hand to monitor all the uh, information of people uh, with the uh, support of the telcos. Only uh, Myanmar has like uh, four or five different telcos. Only two resistors resisted that time. One was Talenor and the other uh, Orido. 
but otherwise you know everything was being surveilled be it you know your telephone calls uh, be it your uh, uh, whatsapp or facebook uh, uh, messages that what also there is like uh, uh, lots of uh, information out there. Uh, many people have digged down that uh, since 2019, Myanmar has bought uh, unlawful, uh, you know, surveillance equipments, and which were actually in 2019 and 20, telcos were asked to actually install these surveillance uh, spywares. Uh, uh, and only again, you know, it was only Telenor which uh, came out publicly and said that, okay, we don't want to have that. Uh, we don't know about other telcos, how they managed and what they were doing. Uh, but Myanmar overall, when we talk about like pr privacy or internet freedom or uh, 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 freedom of expression, things have gone really down as they go in like, you know, close societies plus when there's dictatorship. Yeah, and, and now they're not only keeping their surveillance online to trying to get the grasp on the citizens, mm -hmm. but they're also going manually on the streets, checking people's phones and doing police checks uh, to make sure that those citizens are not participating in protests and so on. So how exactly is that happening, Annie? So what's happening, uh, because uh, as I mentioned now, there's like a dictatorship there, there's martial law and, and uh, and it's not only one side any, uh, alone now, it's like both parties, like pro-democracy, uh, militias, uh, quote unquote, and the military that has weapon, both the sides are very active on the streets. Uh, where I was living, for example, in uh, Yangon city, every 200 meters uh, by like June, they had like military, like, you know, checkpoints. So uh, physical security was very much more in danger. So, uh, uh, of course, digital security is important, but when someone with a gun is asking me for my phone, I have no other choice to give my uh, hand over my phone. And then it jeopardizes everyone else who's connected to me through that simple phone of mine. So there was a point that we all stopped using our uh, uh, smartphones and keeping them at home. And we all get, uh, went back to Nokia 3310. And that also actually made uh, the uh, uh, military, uh, the people who used to stop us very, uh, angry that why are you using this why don't you have a phone with pictures for example and uh, we have talked to many people in Myanmar many pro-democracy uh, citizens who were stopped and surveilled and uh, unfortunately some of them kept their phones they kept, their phones were used as a uh, um, uh, something against them, you know, uh, all the information they had, the pictures they have taken, or for example, on the internet, Facebook, or uh, Viber is very much uh, used in uh, Myanmar, uh, three finger salute pictures, or anywhere else people were moving, uh, any information shared became something uh, uh, that was used against them in the uh, these military run courts right now. Yes, and in fact, you interviewed uh, one young woman, an activist, who was taking part in these protests, and uh, what happened to her was exactly that. She was coming back from a protest. She had pictures on, their, on her phone. She got arrested and she had to endure this completely denial of freedom of, it's not even freedom of speech, it's even freedom of thinking because you're not private to keep your own thoughts, your own information on yourself. Uh, so can you tell us uh, a little bit more about her before we go to her audio? Uh, um, uh, this young... Uh... A 16-year-old girl I got to know through a, a network. I was running a, a, a safe house in Myanmar uh, and I got a call one day that, okay, ha have you read about this person? Uh, and I was like, yeah, she was one of the few people who uh, was interviewed after being uh, released from the detention, unlawful detention she had. And she was underage and um, somehow... Uh, I think again, you know, mask, like the technology as well, we say it's like a double fold, same with these masks uh, that really saved many pro-democracy uh, um, activists and Generation Z uh, that people couldn't see their faces. So, uh, but anyway, this girl, uh, her pictures uh, went viral, her uh, uh, interview went viral that what happened in the detention center. Uh, she was underaged. That was one of the reasons that she was released. We don't know uh, what really happened, you know, how, uh, but five days uh, she stayed in the infamous uh, uh, detention center. So I think it's better if we hear her clip, how she describes uh, uh, her ordeal, and then we can go further. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah.
everyone was protesting and everyone was on the street. And then they make the protests illegal and that they will shoot us if we ever protest again. Or we still protest. Whenever they came to shoot us and separate us, we just ran back to the streets and hide. It was like that the whole month. That day, we came back from the protests. While we were walking on the platform of the road, two military trucks blocked in front of us. All the armed soldiers ran out of them and forced us to put down on our knee and face to the ground. They pointed at guns to our head. They told us to give them their phone right away so that we can ask a message. So they took our phone and they just forced us at gunpoint. Uh, I was the one who edited this part, but it's quite shocking to hear it again uh, even, isn't it, Annie? Because uh, this testimony from Olivia, which is an alias name that we're using so she doesn't get exposed, uh, it just shows you how powerless you get in such a situation where someone points a gun at you and you just have to give them all the information they need. So in that sense, we can see how digital security and physical security, they're very much interconnected. Is having information in your hands becoming dangerous? Um, I think in situation like these where uh, our physical security is jeopardized, you know, and we uh, have to keep less and less information on our digital gadgets and how, uh, again, you know, it's it's very thin line, you know, uh, we don't need to store things, for example, on the phones or on our laptops. Uh, we started doing trainings with uh, pro-democracy activists and journalists and frontline defenders, journalists who whose job is basically to uh, uh, keep this information and keep gathering the testimonies, they were also putting their life in danger by keeping this, you know, uh, all the information. So uh, it was very difficult to A, to first make people realize that keeping all the information on your phones about uh, pro-democracy uh, or anything which is uh, which is anti-junta, anti-Myanmar's uh, uh, military, which is known as Tatmadaw, it's going to put you in danger, your loved ones in danger, the people you're working in danger and the whole uh, pro-democracy movement in danger. Because as Olivia mentioned, there are many other testimonies where they're being in, we are being informed that they just take your phone and then they find out who else is on your phone contacts. Even the contact list becomes so difficult. So we uh, kept on people when we were evacuating people, for example, we kept telling them that delete any foreign, you know, for example, anyone's name, that name is like, you know, sound very uh, foreign, put it into like Myanmar names. Because as uh, many people who came out from detention, they said they were being asked repeatedly, who's funding you, who's funding you? This whole paranoia against foreign funding is very much there in Myanmar as well. So with, uh, like different cases, they came out, they gave this testimony. Then phones, for example, pictures, we become so much used to like keeping our memories and our like, you know, whatever, I would take a picture here or there. And these people who were like being arrested and later they, are, they have like some of them, of our uh, colleagues and friends have been like now uh, uh, sentenced for many years just for uh, keeping these pictures or for example, three finger salute. Uh, uh, pictures or portraits in their phones. So it became like, you know, how much information you need to keep with yourself. So we keep telling people to delete, consume, delete, consume, mm -hmm. delete. And this is one of the way to keep yourself safe. For example, uh, right now, uh, at the airports as well in Myanmar, uh, they ask you to check your phones and your, they run like some, uh, some thing on your uh, laptops as well. Uh, so yeah, that's what's happening. Which is quite a paradox, isn't it? Because it, it seemed that when the inf internet first came, mm -hmm. that uh, the more information we could access, the merrier. Uh, but having the access to that information doesn't necessarily mean that you should keep it with you uh, nowadays. Exactly. Yeah. Keeping it, it's what I have learned in the last 10 months is um, A, I keep changing my uh, uh, digital uh, ID. B, I don't keep as much information to myself and see I don't want to be connected to anyone uh, who I don't know earlier like I think 10 years ago we wanted to make our networks grow mm -hmm. uh, by just writing blogs I wanted like more people uh, 
over the time, I think we all have learned it the hard way that our, we don't meet, like meeting strangers in our daily life as well. So who do I want to include into my digital uh, circle? And the logarithms are very dangerous, for example. If someone becomes friends with me, they will get to know all my, like the people I'm working with. Yeah. And I think that's and, uh, that's the case that we heard from Olivia as yes. well. We have another <laughs> quote separated from her. Yeah, let's to know listen exactly to it. what they're after, what kind of information we need to protect. I clear some data on my phone, but I still have some photos that I was three fingers saluting, holding the protest sign. So they start to interrogate us. They were writing down all the contacts of people on the phone, and they took second shots of the conversation, every detail about the person I was chatting or texting to. They want me to tell every single one of their name and address. I feel very overwhelmed and furious. I was thinking like, this can't be legal. They can't just check my phone like this. But then I remember, oh, wait, we are in Myanmar and they are the military. Of course, they can do that. Another officer, right after he came inside, he stood in front of me and he shot him aggressively and threatened me that he can call me right there and get rid of my body and no one will ever see me again. It was like living hell for me. Yeah, so it's it's heartbreaking, isn't it, uh, Annie? Because you 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 get inside people's heads so much when you suppress their freedom of of, of expression and their privacy that uh, they feel like they can't share anymore. They can't express any dissent even to their friends, their their family members, because they might be putting themselves at risk. So in a citizen's perspective, um, what can be done for someone who's facing a similar situation where they've, they're facing those violations or of the, the very basic digital rights? What can we do to protect ourselves? It, it's a very uh, tough question and situation. I must um, stress upon this because Generation Z, that's like were the, on the forefront and still are on the forefront of pro-democracy movement in Myanmar. Uh, they all are like, they're digital kids, you know, they are like digital nomads. They didn't have to like switch from like fonts to uh, like uh, letters, paper letters. They had never done that. So their whole communication, their whole life, uh, they, were, they are global citizens in Myanmar and they are very much similar to what any uh, uh, young kid in Europe is. So for them, snatching away this whole like freedom, A, it's like really traumatic for them. B, they really believe in the values, the core values of like democracy. And they want that if you listen, you have listened to uh, Olivia and you've talked to her, you would, it, it's astonishing, it's amazing, you know, very positive that she knows her basic fundamental human rights or like she was annoyed that why they are doing it, but she this had can't to. can't be yeah, legal, she said yeah. it. And uh, they are just uh, taking it away. So what the young people, which I follow or talk with, for example, on Instagram or on, uh, uh, they're very active on Instagram. There's a whole generation or uh, for example, on other, like uh, uh, they start, use Telegram a lot now in Myanmar, for example. And what they do is they all are like a digital savvy. They use VPNs a lot. And they try to, again, you know, we all like, we don't keep any information to ourselves. Neither they do like whoever we interact with. Sadly, what's happening in Myanmar right now is like uh, today, there are more than 400 uh, um, telco, um, what do you call them, uh, boosters or they are being destroyed. And uh, like there's so little, like uh, now uh, we have so little informers or sources or people who are connected with the world. And that's what the junta wanted. The things have gone so bad in the country that people are no more connected. A, there's a big fear. Uh, you don't want to get caught. Everyone knows that there's unlawful surveillance there. Back in the day in 2019, there are like reports have come out. We have all the evidence that the military has bought uh, surveillance uh, spywares and they asked the uh, you know telcos to uh, install them and we have seen what has happened to a Norwegian company Telenor when they refused to install anything or uh, you know budge uh, uh, against like whatever the military wanted and that was the only 
uh, uh, telco in Myanmar that in the first uh, two weeks of the coup kept uh, making the public statements that this is the pressure we are facing from the military. We don't know about the others. That means they were cooperating. So from the day one, we knew that, okay, our phones are being tapped. So everyone moved to like uh, more secure ways, but then we you don't even know about like bigger companies, be it Facebook, be it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Twitter. We can't vouch for them, uh, but at the moment, uh, uh, the good news we think is like Facebook or Twitter, they're very much pro people at the moment. They have learned from the past. For example, Facebook has done like really uh, outrageous uh, things when the Rohingya crisis happened. So we hope that they have learned and they're not cooperating with the uh, military junta. And that's uh, how it uh, apparently uh, looks like. But coming back to this, that how uh, individuals can, you know, uh, it's very difficult, you know, our, uh, this public and when you're living in close societies, when you know your human rights are like curtailed and you don't have, you know, you're not treated as a human being. So uh, digital security, you know, digital rights or freedom is like a very, uh, a very difficult to, you know, uh, get to that level. It's only like we can support these people for bringing their testimonies on like public platforms or do some advocacy that more and more companies, uh, of course, uh, I'm sure some people who are listening to this, they know about uh, uh, Bicot, uh, uh, the whole campaign, which is done, uh, led by Generation Z in Myanmar. And many people are not using the military. For example, MPT is uh, 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 one telco, people are not using that. And they were using Telenor, but now Telenor has been like, uh, so it had, had to be sold to uh, uh, Lebanese M1 uh, 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 business, uh, which is also very shady, yeah. but it's like, you know, very difficult right now in Myanmar. And I, uh, I don't see like, what's the end of it. For example, we also tried people uh, tried using like Thai Sims thinking like, but Thailand is also not a very uh, uh, open society when it comes to uh, so laws and tricky you know, anyway. Yeah. So it's like the whole, I think the whole uh, region, it's like very uh, difficult for us to, um, we really have to reflect upon like what is privacy and how um, in closed societies where there's like any way you're you don't have any human rights left it's like dictatorship so but that's what we're going to try to do <laughs> we're going to try to reflect on how we can uh try to find what we can do even in difficult situations <laughs> uh, i'm going to get back to you any i think it's brilliant uh, the work that you're doing and olivia is a very courageous person for being here with us and sharing her testimony. So I'd like to thank her once again. Uh, but now we're gonna get another case story. So if you have questions for any, write them down. We're gonna get back to that part. Uh, we're gonna see another part of the region now, which is India. Uh, I hope that we have here our next speaker connecting virtually uh, because we're gonna talk about uh, another aspect of the surveillance uh, which, which could be considered, which is the ID systems that are being implemented in India, the Aadhaar system, which is not necessarily such a, a digital violation in the sense that they're getting our information, but it could be a much broader and potential issue at scale. Uh, so I hope that our speaker is there. Osama Mansar, are you there, my friend? Yeah, hi, everyone. Everyone hey. who is on the site and everybody who is virtually Hi. there. So, Hi, Osama, Annie. let me just introduce you before you go on, Osama. He's a dearest friend of mine, um, also an expert here at the Media Information Literacy Expert Network. It's great to see you. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of the Digital Empowerment Foundation in India, bringing connectivity and uh, digital literacy to rural parts of the area. So with more than uh, a thousand locations, if I'm not mistaken, throughout India. So Osama, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, we've been listening about this other system, which is this one number that unites the lives of the people in India, uh, which is not, you're not required by law to have it, but without it, you can't access education. You can't enroll in universities. You can't go to hospitals and you can't, you know, even, open a bank account. So what are the implications of these Aadhaar ID system uh, for the citizens in, in India? Well, that is a, that will be a long tutorial uh, for the audience there. But uh, uh, what you said is that you can't do anything without Aadhaar is, is actually the dichotomy is that you can do all of this uh, without Aadhaar. 
uh, but uh, but the practical system is that uh, you know there is this called UID, a unique uh, ID or um, Aadhaar, as it is. Uh, by the way, Aadhaar's meaning in Hindi is the foundation. Uh, you know, so uh, so the, uh, practically, what is happening is that it is it is being motivated, it is being influenced, it is being marketed, it is being. Uh, a spread uh, that everybody should have this unique ID. Uh, uh, as per the law, the law itself says that you don't need to have, I mean, you, you, you can say no, you don't want to have this, but practically everybody, so government certainly uh, take a, take a uh, pride in saying that they have reached out of 1.35 billion of population, they have reached 1.2 billion or something like that is already been done. People have been uh, enrolled as having unique ID. Uh, but uh, uh, that, so that's, that's the way it started, but gradually to make it even more uh, useful or more relevant, more uh, uh, you know, practical, uh, government started linking it to every need. And then it became a, a kind of uh, you know, pervasive culture that each and every office, each and every administrative office, each and every organization started uh, asking people that we need to have your ID to be in place. Uh, whether you have a bank account, whether you have uh, admission in a school or wherever you go. So basically that, uh, that, that, that one number became your, uh, your, your most popular uh, you know, uh, existence or belonging of you. Uh, but, but the flip side of this entire thing is that, as you know, India has got about anywhere, uh, depending which statistics are you looking for, but anywhere between 300 to 500 million poor people, you know, who, uh, who are actually dependent on uh, various government entitlements or those, you know, so so they can't survive without ration, they can't survive without health access, they can't survive without. So these are the people who are totally dependent on government givings or social welfare um, uh, entitlements. And that is where this entire game uh, opens up, that how they suffer because of the necessity of this unique ID. I am not even getting into the controversial area uh, where uh, the, 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 the haves have a serious separate problem of where, you know, it gets into surveillance, it gets into different kind of things. But I am talking about what you call as a soft part, which is 500 million people, poor people, whom you are saying you can't have your ration without your biometric being identified. You can't have your pension without your biometric being an identified. Biometric, when I say biometric, is a methodology of post-machine utilization where you put your finger as an identification. You know, uh, and and by the way, this is uh, this is enabling because you are illiterate, but this is disabling because you don't know how that identification is going to use. And I am sure you are going to show it on your podcast that how many people on the ground suffering their biometric identity is being stolen, their Aadhaar numbers are being spread everywhere, uh, even government websites, they hang with their databases, they're very proud me, so many people have taken admission in my school, wow, this is the name and this is all their Aadhaar numbers. And then somebody is logging in, taking all those numbers and doing something else, you know. And then, uh, you know, uh, and then, uh, you know, there are stories that, you know, you go to, you are illiterate, you don't know how to read and write, you go to a bank account, you put your uh, thumb and your bank account is open on the screen, but she can't read it or he can't read it. But the banking correspondent or the person who is providing those services of giving you the money or withdrawing your money is keeping that information and keeping that screen open in another screen because you just have to do control T to have another uh, window open and that window can be uh, seen by that other person. So it's very interesting that, uh, you know, we, uh, this, this, this unique ID uh, for the lack of uh, any word, I would say is so vulnerable because of so many reasons that it has become a, a, a reason for maybe identity theft, sometimes bank account theft, sometimes frauds, 
from uh, sometimes your rights being stolen your uh, your 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 assets being stolen and so on and so forth the stories are unlimited um, uh, you can have books after books and encyclopedia of having such case studies of of how people have been uh, you know so what i'm saying is actually it's such a vulnerable number it's such a vulnerable style of utilization uh, in 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 our indian society is that uh, is that uh, the lesser the case study the uh, you know better it is it could have been everything you know uh, of course uh, uh, you know uh, shruti is going to highlight more uh, uh, you know uh, recorded uh, uh, you know uh, uh, stories of uh, privacy perspective and surveillance perspective but what i'm saying is that even for the purpose for which this number was let's say released as your unique id to to have a easy life is not actually turning out to be a easy life uh, because you are vulnerable vulnerable because this one number is connecting everything i mean imagine one mobile is giving you all the information in myanmar where when it is being taken uh, away by the people imagine your one number is taken away by people and anything can be done so isn't it very uh, you know uh, and that number is actually not uh, sacrosanct it's everywhere if you go to typical indian village out of hundreds of houses there is one person providing service of banking access or uh, entitlement access or internet access and uh, if you go to that person's room you will find that hundreds of uid printouts are kept on the table just like that these people come there take it in their hand it's like a post office which is uh, imagine a post office with all the credit cards without cover can you imagine it is available in 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 every nook and corner imagine all the names on a database on excel sheet is on the website with your credit card number there with cvv which i How think would you feel? it's impressive isn't it osama because when we're doing the interviews first the cases started piling up when we we're preparing for the podcast we found a number of case stories so easy and all the, these people they had all those other piles of other on their table to show for uh that they had it you know they had the trust of the citizens but if if they wanted to do something with it they potentially could and that could impact a lot later on down the road Uh, but i just want to highlight uh, that first uh, case story that we brought exactly from india uh because we went to, you know to the very rural areas where you have your centers and you have the connection to those people uh to to find out how this plays out in their real lives so we have here the testimony of uh, shakti who we're going to bring uh, dubbed to english राजस्थान के बाड़मेर डिस्ट्रिक्ट से हूँ और बाड़मेर डिस्ट्रिक्ट मतलब आई एम फ्रॉम बाड़मेर डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ राजस्थान एंड दिस रीजन इज सपोज टू बी वन ऑफ द मोस्ट बैकवर्ड रीजन ऑफ द कंट्री इफ एनी गवर्नमेंट ऑफिशियल गेट्स असाइन टू दिस प्लेस दे एक्चुअली थिंक दैट इट्स अ पनिशमेंट पीपल हियर आर अन अवेयर अबाउट गवर्नमेंट स्कीम्स एंड एंटाइटलमेंट्स एंड दे आर वेरी अनट्रस्टिंग ऑफ पीपल हु आर एजुकेटेड बिकॉज ओवर द इयर्स देव बिन चीटेड अगेन एंड अगेन बाय एजुकेटेड पीपल there is a person named uh, suresh who runs a nimitra center what he did was he applied for pensions for people who have actually passed away already he took their aadhar cards he put his own fingerprint there he put his own mobile phone there and whenever money would come into their account the money from the government pension he would just go and withdraw it in fact not only people who are dead he started doing this with people who are alive as well he would apply for their pensions he would take their aadhar number but he would put his own fingerprint and when asked that you know why my money hasn't come he would say the pension hasn't started yet or the government hasn't released the money yet however there came a time when there was a man who was about 70 or 80 and he had passed away so his son actually went online and he checked the status of the account and he saw that money is coming in every month but it's getting withdrawn and he had no clue where it's getting withdrawn from but the thing is that this man was an rti activist right to information activist so he took all the documents he filed rtis at the banks he you know he 
he just got all the information out and then he took all of that information and filed a case against him after a proper investigation was conducted it was found out that he had done a fraud of 6 lakh rupees so then he was jailed for 3 months and last month he was released and the government cancelled his e mitra license because of uh, all of this so he opened another e mitra in the name of someone else and in fact he has restarted his center and he is still running an e mitra center lekin wo abhi matlab center chala bhi raha hai office So uh, some that would be ironical if it wasn't tragic right um we see this case of this middleman uh, committing fraud uh, and not even not even people don't realize it but also he's able even after getting caught to continue it so if we think of digital first it's a brilliant thing uh, i've been there to india v- visiting some of the villages with you and uh, you, you give people access especially the most vulnerable to their rights so th- in order to get their entitlements uh, their ration their food their money uh, they need to you know g- go and impress their id there so they have this mobile uh, scheme where they they select one person in the village where they're able to you know connect people even the illiterate to be able to access those schemes but in the name of ease of use if you compile all that into one single id system and, and people don't have the education or the digital literacy uh to go after it it seems that the government is telling everyone in order for you to have your rights you need to you know know the basics of digital uh but i don't see anyone providing people that awareness or that education so that they don't get exploited Uh, which is a, a bizarre thing if you if you ask me uh, but so how should we look at this osama from from a citizen's perspective what sort of solutions are out there uh, what could be done is it awareness that we need to raise is it uh, what exactly do we need to to look at so uh, it's very interesting you know uh, we always think that digital is just a technology or digital is just a means to do uh, some things but we didn't we don't take digital as a, a cultural embedding or a change of culture into the system that we make policy for and that's uh, ironical i will give you uh, an example of 66a it's an act that was created to actually uh, a very bad act from the perspective of freedom of expression and under that uh, police was arresting anybody who was uh, who was even commenting on something which is let's say not acceptable to the government and then gradually the government changed and then then and then that act was withdrawn and and the and the irony is that even now government of india's many police department cyber crime experts they arrest people in the name of act that doesn't exist i mean it has been withdrawn and doesn't exist so what is what is very important is that when we make a policy which has got digital included into it it's very important to look at the cultural part of it the social part of it the practices the ecosystems and how do you do it you know that's very very important for example doing digital literacy and not doing digital safety is not going to work you know because digital literacy is going to enable you to share all your data but digital safety will not uh, make all those data safeguard you know or behind the firewall or or not shared you know it's something like when you get a credit card you very clearly said that don't store those number anywhere you just memorize it that's an instruction that's a, that's the that's the tutorial that you get but we don't get any tutorial for any new digital policy that we make there is no awareness about it there is no tutorial about it there is no uh, literacy about it there is there is no educational part of it i mean you tell me how how many schools and colleges or education system that we have embedded with a curriculum of having digital literacy digital culture digital society as a part of the curriculum of understanding you know so so we are certainly uh, and and this onus is basically on the government who makes policy i mean you cannot make something in the name of ease and recently i'll give you another example when the pandemic was there when it was made mandatory that everybody has to take and vac- take vaccination it was also made mandatory that you have to go through a portal online portal to register yourself to get a vaccination 
Now tell me how many areas of the country is connected? Even on the statistical data of India, internet is still hasn't reached to more than 40 or 50% of Indians. Then how can you make something mandatory for uh, which the gateway of which is internet, you know, yeah. uh, for taking vaccination? And ultimately that happened, you know, government ultimately they themselves said that it is not possible. You can walk in into the hospital or, or a local, you register yourself there locally face to face and you get your vaccination. Then we will put the data on your behalf. I mean, then, and, and when you are putting the data on your behalf, then we don't know what kind of data are being put. No, and I think without that's... OTP, it is not possible. You know, the uh, OTP is another barrier. So what is very, very, very uh, important that the, the more we are getting digital, the more cultural uh, integration is required, or social integration is required. And that's not happening. And that's the danger. No, I think that's a, a perfect consideration that you put us on. How can we integrate exactly all those layers, right? When it comes to digital literacy, education into the policy level, and the bigger discussion, I think that's an, an, essential part, an essential part. And that's exactly why I want to, to invite Shruti to join us also in the conversation. Uh, she's also a guest, Shruti uh, Trikanad, I hope I pronounced your name right. <laughs> she is a program officer at the Center for Internet Society in India. And she also works primarily to, on issues such as the digital ID. Uh, she did a lot of research as well as how the Adar is taking place regarding the court system, the legal system. Uh, so Shruti, uh, welcome. Hi, Alex. Thank you. So glad to be here. No, it's fantastic to see you. And I was hoping you could give us a little bit of a legal perspective on, on the sense, because if we look at the other, a, a lot of data is available in the public domain, which is another aspect that we could discuss. But what did your test review exactly when we focus on the issues of the system especially regarding to privacy. You know, we're talking about the importance of citizens being able to protect their personal information, be it in a, in a, in a, in a sense where it's very, very sensitive like Myanmar or in India where this data could be abused uh, if it falls into the hands of, of the masses. So from a legal perspective, how that plays out? Um, yeah, so usually when I think about this, I think of it in two ways. Um, one would be what the regulatory or legal surrounding of um, the digital ID system is. And the other, which I'm not really gonna talk about a lot, but how the technology itself is designed, right? And this kind of plays back to um, even what Annie was saying, which is that regardless of whether there is a rule of law, it, I mean, it's on, on, in some ways it doesn't really matter what the law is, it matters who is enforcing it. So to kind of safeguard that, you have technology that is like that, enhances privacy by design, for instance. So the, the main thing I would say there is the, that we move away from the Aadhaar model. The Aadhaar model is a very particular kind of a digital ID system where you have um, a centralized database. You only have the government being the ID provider. You make it mandatory. These are things that are all, uh, like this is what the Aadhaar model is characterized by. And it's kind, quite different from other sort of developed countries models like Estonia, um, Canada, UK all have digital ID systems that are very unlike Aadhaar. So in there you could have like, a, you know, move away from a centralized database, have access control that is kind of determined by the technology itself and not just by um, the law. Um, but when we talk about the law itself, which is, I, I suppose at this, at this stage, the only thing that you can address in the Aadhaar system, um, how we looked at it, we came up with a framework that kind of tests um, uh, the environment surrounding Aadhaar in three ways. So I'll, I'll be very brief about this because it is very lengthy. Um, the first thing we look at is a rule of law, which is basically whether the digital ID system is governed properly by one uh, or many laws that cover all aspects of the digital ID system. And here, Aadhaar we found was lacking in several ways. Uh, one really important way was the purpose of the Aadhaar system as, itself. So when it began, as Osama was saying as well, uh, when it began, it was to target the, um, the poor population to like access the subsidies that they, um, that they are beneficiaries for. But now it has kind of absolutely left that purpose. Now it's mandatory for everyone to link their Aadhaar card to their uh, income tax filing. It's mandatory to link it to a, a slew of other things. So it's kind of moved away from that purpose. And that purpose also determines exactly 
um, like a lot of parts of the system itself. So one thing that we would say in the law is to not allow the Aadhaar system to be used for purposes other than what the data was collected for. And that is not present in the Aadhaar Act right now. It, it kind of liberally allows the central government to determine what use Aadhaar can be made for. Right now, uses of Aadhaar are also being determined by other laws, like our money laundering law, et cetera, um, all of which we, we believe should be um, addressed immediately. Another really, really important thing, and this, this also does address the fraud that Osama was talking about, is the accountability of the administrator of the system. So the Aadhaar system is administered by the UIDAI, which is a body that created the Aadhaar system, maintains it, administers it, and is also the only regulator for it. So what this essentially means is that regardless of what it does, nobody can kind of hold it accountable because it's the only body that holds itself accountable. I mean, that makes no sense to me, but there is nobody else that can uh, do anything to the UIDA. And this also extends to, for a long time, nobody was allowed to make any complaints in the Aadhaar system. So even if the fraud that Osama was talking about would occur, you weren't allowed to complain. The only thing you could do was let UIDA DAI know, and they would file a complaint on your behalf, which was something that, I mean, if they didn't want to take action, they just wouldn't. And we saw that as well when initially, um, when, the Aadhaar, when the enrollment was happening for Aadhaar, they found that a lot of fraud had happened. A lot of um, uh, identities were created that were not real. But there was absolutely no action taken against UIDI for this because, again, they're the only ones who can take action. So that it's is a, a thing very difficult I... thing, isn't it? Because we heard from, from the example that it took uh, someone who was uh, an, uh, an act activist on access to information to do all the steps to either file a complaint or something like that. So when we look at the legitimacy of these systems, is it really to make it more transparent and maybe give access to citizens? to have a, a hand in that, Shruti? Um, I would honestly say it, it doesn't seem that way. And we can even, so even when we were talking about the security of the system, initially there were a lot of um, activist research organizations that pointed out, this was, this was many years earlier, that there, was, that there were a lot of security uh, like lacunas in the system. And instead of you know, that being taken in the way it should, which is that they, the UADI try to address these security um, problems. They instantly kind of file charges against a lot of these research organizations, a lot of journalists to say that they attempted to breach the system. And yeah, we, we see from that that there is very little transparency. It's kind of like the government is on the offensive. They're just, they're not taking um, any feedback about this. They're just kind of instantly going against anyone that says, something about the Aadhaar system. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I think that's a super interesting discussion. Uh, and I think it's not only the other system in India that we're seeing some issues when, when it comes to that uh, privacy of citizens and, and personal information and so on, uh, but also on a global level. Uh, so uh, I'm going to invite to join us here on the discussion also uh, Edin Omanovich, because I think Shruti raised some very interesting points there, there. Edin, if you can hear me, I can't see you yet, but I yeah, hope that you're going to pop up. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Uh, Edin is the Advocacy Director from Privacy International, and he also works around exposing and challenging these abuses of power by governments worldwide. So Edin, these things that Shruti is mentioning, uh, do they happen elsewhere also, if we look at the world? Uh, is it a common issue, what we're seeing with ID systems, surveillance from governments, uh, getting personal information and so on. Hi, um, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, there's echoes of these kind of issues around the world. Um, I think one thing that was mentioned was the lack of a legal framework. So the lack of a data protection law in India. Unfortunately, we see that elsewhere as well. So um, these kind of digital ID systems are generally proposed by large donors, for example, um, and governments, particularly in weaker countries, uh, as solutions to a whole range of different problems, whether it's access to welfare or for security reasons, but no real kind of substantive thought given to how this will play out in practice. And without a well-written and well-enforced law, such as the data protection law, there's going to be inevitably all these kind of issues. So to be clear, 
no ID system is going to ever be 100% secure. The most advanced intelligence agencies in the world cannot keep their systems secure. They've been regularly hacked. So inevitably, this information is going to be leaked. And that's why you need a well-enforced uh, data rights and people who have access and knowledge about it and a regulator that can actually take action to actually help people and to protect people's rights. In weaker states where these laws don't exist, where these regulators aren't able to enforce the law, these kind of issues are simply inevitable. Yet at the same time, what we've seen is donors and governments rush to these kind of solutions for a whole manner of things. And originally it might start with, uh, for example, let's try and make sure that people have access to welfare, but there's inevitably always function creep. It'll always end up being um, a more substantive um, solution in scope. So for example, it then become a security thing. Law enforcement will inevitably want access to it. Um, and I think the really the first question that should always be asked is why? Why do we need to build these systems? Why, if everyone is entitled indeed as they are to a legal identity, why does it have to be a digital ID system? Why does it have to involve biometrics? That kind of question is lacking because I think often in a lot of cases, donors are just jumping to the most sexy, the most kind of high tech solution, which is biometric ID systems, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think it comes down, as you said, different countries and different regions are in different parts of the process. So where to start might be a, a different uh, challenge or a different solution, depending where they are. I'd like to hear a little bit also uh, about what Privacy International uh, is doing regarding this and what are the most, like if we had to pick one of the most crucial issues that perpasses all these different uh, states and regions that we're talking about here today, uh, or even others that are uh, happening across the globe, uh, is, is there one thing that we should, you know, one common trend that we need to tackle urgently before uh, our digital rights will be just mm. out of the box or something like that? Yeah. Um, so I think the pandemic has really just underlined and exposed how interconnected just everything is. The world is, people, um, civil society groups, governments. And I think one kind of thread that's running through all this is the role of powerful actors, whether it's companies or governments that are essentially have the power to change all this. So we spoke earlier about um, surveillance and particularly in Myanmar, there are hundreds of companies out there who sell surveillance tools to governments and it's basically a free for all. There's very little regulation over it. Um, so we're essentially trying to put pressure on these companies to respect people's rights to stop selling this equipment and for governments to step in because they have the power to actually restrain this industry. So, you know, there's a lot of things that people can do in terms of protecting their own individual rights. So using encryption, using certain apps, even stopping storing certain data on their devices. But then, you know, this essentially absolves governments and companies from the responsibility to also look after their rights. So we need to put pressure on governments to actually pass laws and to enforce them. And where they can't, we need to put pressure on companies to act as the last line of defense um, to protect peoples. And unfortunately, the way that we're going, um, even not putting information and uh, stopping yourself from storing stuff on mobile phones isn't really going to be enough because governments are increasingly adding data to databases or increasingly demanding that everything that we do, whether it's uh, accessing services, is somehow the data around that is collected and stored somewhere. Um, and then increasingly it's becoming even more difficult to walk down the street uh, because you have issues such as um, facial rollout of facial recognition cameras. So I think the risks are becoming a lot higher. There's a lot more risk um, in all aspects of life. Um, but I was, at the same time, what we can do about it is put pressure on international companies and international governments to actually be more aware of how this is impacting people around the world, and particularly the most marginalized around the world. And through coordination, through civil society organization, through um, international coordination at governmental level, th there are real opportunities for change and things are changing. Perfect. No, I, I think that's brilliant. I just want to invite people here in the room and online to pose in the questions. I don't want to be too selfish. I know that we have an incredible lineup of speakers and you have some 
burning thoughts in your heads. Um, so get ready. If you want to come, feel free to come. If you're in the chat, send a question and we're going to address that as well. Uh, meanwhile, I just want to say that I think that's really interesting, Edding, because since here at Millen, since we work with media information literacy, obviously we try to find solutions and, you know, find a way that citizens can fight back for their rights on a bottom up approach. But I, I think that's not enough. You know, we have to do what we can, but we also need to focus our efforts uh, in terms of regulation, as you said, uh, on companies and government bodies, because at the end of the day, they should be held to account. I think that's a, a super that you said. I think that's super important for us to remember. Ah, I see we have a gentleman here. <laughs> Please go on. Uh, what's your name, sir? Hello, uh, my name is Asim. And uh, I was uh, listening to this all interesting conversation. Uh, we always had the threats uh, throughout our history. Uh, authorities are manipulators. They always use the information for their purposes. If it is corporates, they will use that information to generate more revenues. If it is authoritarian governments, regimes, they will use it for their control. These things will keep happening. The problem with the digital era is that now it is very easy to connect the dots. We have one piece of information. On the basis of that, we can develop the profiling, then these algorithms, and uh, now as we talk about that face recognition is connected with that, our biometric data is connected with that, uh, our social network is connected with that, our uh, daily routine of doing things, using Siri, everything is uh, uh, getting captured. So it is very easy to identify what we do, what we think. Uh, having an Aadhaar card might not be a problem because there are national ID cards almost in every country. Even in Europe, we have the residence cards. Uh, the problem is that who has the access to that system if that system is accessed by the right people or not, and how we can put the policies in place that uh, those systems, those, that in, uh, piece of information will not be misused. That is the key question what we should ask by ourselves that how at sitting on the internet governance forum, we can come up with some such a thought process which we can then apt every stage wherever we are working, we can push it forward that how we can find the right solution which can be implemented everywhere because now we are living in a global village. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much. If any of and other speakers want to comment it on that, uh, please feel free to go as well. Uh, I just want to uh, add one thing to that. Uh, when we talk about solutions, we all know that uh, all these um, spywares, for example, or any inter unlawful intercept uh, spywares uh, bring in, in closed societies or where we, we see dictatorship or even in democracy. But when there are like stronger democratic systems and governments in place, there's more safeguards available for uh, citizens. And that is what we have learned and we are learning. Then, you know, for example, if it comes through the parliament, through people, there are different layers of it rather than when one military guy just at the back door, he gets a deal with someone and, you know, they just place it. When things are more behind doors, it's more difficult to manage. And for example, in Myanmar, until 2021, we were not aware that there's some uh, uh, spyware was, were bought and telcos have already installed them until you know they were bought in 2019, but we got to know in 2021. So I think, uh, of course, like in, uh, you mentioned that Europe also have uh, uh, ID card systems, but surveillance, you know, this is uh, in closed societies, I think we see more as compared to uh, uh, countries which have more democratic processes in place. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annie. And we have more people lined up to, to ask you about activists. Uh, uh, I see that we have Elias Nasrula as a, a guest here on the chat. Elias, if you want to, to ask the questions and unmute yourself, I think you can do that as well. Otherwise I can read it here on the chat.
Okay, I, I think you can't unmute, unfortunately. So I'll just read your question. Any, uh, first of all, question for you. Uh, what methods the activists are using uh, to try to come up with solutions? Uh, he knows that you can't share everything, uh, but maybe some ideas what could be used in that way. And we also have a question from for Shruti. Uh, Shruti, is it fair to say that a big part of the problems of the other system is due to the seemingly deteriorating rule of law in India? So, please. Yeah, and if you want okay. to. Okay, I'll uh, go ahead first. Um, for activist question, I think in Myanmar specific, uh, most of the uh, activists, they no more uh, uh, go use um, anything which is leads to like digital footprints. That's very interesting pattern, uh, which we have seen that people have gone to jungles and to like those areas which are uh, under PDFs in Myanmar. Um, they are not connected in uh, like how we see they should be connected and uh, technology should help them. But it's other way around. We are coming back to old ways of communications, like more safer ways. Yeah. Yeah. Super, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Shruti, please uh, go ahead if you're there with us. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say it is part of the problem or more rather part of the impact of allow of having a system that kind of allows surveillance and changes the relationship between a citizen and a state so right now for example the state could easily sort of cut deactivate your Aadhaar card and then you're instantly not allowed to access a suite of services so yeah I, I would say the government in place would is very um does impact that a lot but it's also just how the system allows that to happen which matters i think well, thank you so much, Shruti. I think that's essential. I, I know we said we're going to try to bring solutions, uh, but there are even more burning thoughts from everything that you guys are saying here. But I think those are great points to start off. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up your session at the Internet Governance Forum due to time. But I'd like to thank everyone who participated and joined us, our incredible speaker lineup as well. Uh, this was the seventh episode of Digital Rights Explored, Local Fights, Global Perspectives especially recorded here as part of the IGF. And if you like what you heard, please make sure to like, follow the podcast, connect with us, send in questions, and so on. We'll be thrilled to have you all around. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone that was part of here with us today. We talked to Eni Zaman, Olivia, Ozama Manzar, Shakti Singh, Shruti Trikanath, and Edding Omanovic. Thank you all. You guys have been essential to this discussion. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I'd also like to thank our producer, Anne Omerovich, our consultant, Hannah Hempel, Abner Manzar for the dubbing, and a special thanks also to Leah Vinet for making this possible. We're very grateful as well for the UN people here at the Internet Governance Forum and for the government of Poland. Dziękuję. I hope that was pronounced right. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by Millen, the Media Information Literacy Expert Network with the support of Deutsche Welle Academy. And if you want to continue this conversation, we'll be more than, how, more than happy to talk to you. Just drop us a line. Uh, my name is Alexandre Marao. I'm tuning out. I'll see you next month with a new episode. Ciao.